Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you guys are located. Today, my name is Tucker Johnson, and I am going to be your instructor today, not your host, your instructor, because we are experiencing NIMSI Live Learning, which is something that we've been playing around with, with the Workshop Wednesdays, and I think that we're going to be doing it a little bit more often if my VP of Sales lets me keep doing this stuff for free. I hope she does, because I think it adds, adds some value. Anyways, NIMSI Learning and workshops and events, we cover, uh, we cover processes, localization processes, strategies, industry intelligence, best practices, language technology. The NIMSI Learning experience will give you and your global team the tools you need to take your organization to the next level. Our offerings cover localization project management training, localization QA training, sales process training, translation resources, and much more. Our ever-expanding selection of training and development options are what you need to get on the right track for your organization, assuming you're not already on the right track. A lot of you guys already are. I know a lot of you know a lot more about this stuff than I do. So anyways, if you are not already subscribed to NIMSI Insights, um, most of you guys are logging in from LinkedIn, so make sure to follow NIMSI Insights, our company page, so that you're going to be the first, or one of the first, to find out when we publish new content or when we host new live streams like this. Uh, our sister program, NIMSI Live, I guess technically this is an MG Live. It's an MG Live Learning. On MG Live, we like to invite guests from all around the world, basically anybody with some value to add, a good data set or some good advice, um, people from the industry, people that you know and love a lot of times, but we'll host anybody. So if you're interested in that, go check out our NIMSI Live playlists on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, if you want to watch the video, and all of that stuff, wherever you get your podcast. Before we get back into this, or before we really get into this, I should say, um, this is a free, this is publicly available, and I think we're going to be leaving the recording up um, after after the workshop. Also, if you guys are, are looking for the deck, I think we can make that available. Uh, send an email to info at nimsy.com after the show and ask nicely. Say please and thank you, and we'll make sure to get that deck over you, to you today. But because it's free, of course, we're going to be plugging a lot of stuff today. So first I want to start off with, as usual, I like to plug the Multilingual Mercantile. Our, our sister company, our partners over at Multilingual, have a shop for you to go buy all of your cool localization gear, some of which I have and wear. I really like it. Uh, use discount code NIMSY Live to get 25% off your purchase. Uh, going back to the platform, uh, a little bit about that. We're doing this as a live stream via LinkedIn events because basically all of our friends are already here on LinkedIn, so it makes it nice and convenient for everybody to join. Uh, LinkedIn has, has made some changes recently, and frankly, I haven't been doing live streams for a little while, so I'm not sure what all those changes are. Maybe you guys can tell me in the comments, but one thing I do know is that you can smash those Oh, gosh, I, I actually use that word. Smash those like buttons. Um, if you if you see something or you hear something that you like, also take advantage of that networking tab. If you're Especially if you're dialing in from desktop, talk to your friends. This is an event. It's an online event. It's not a, it's not a webinar. It's not a pre-recorded thing. So make sure to be interacting in the chat. Uh, we got all of the chats over here. I'll be trying. I don't have a... I don't have an operator today to help me with the comments, but I'll be um, taking a look at those comments as much as I can to make sure I get to your questions. Introducing today's topic, uh, today we're going to be talking about language quality. Specifically, we're going to be talking about setting up a language quality program. Uh, throughout this project or throughout this event, uh, participants, uh, where we're going to be reviewing the language quality concepts within the context of a localization workflow. Um, hopefully, you're going to be able to better understand the basics of building a language quality program. After this, you're going to learn how to customize the quality processes in a sustainable way. Um, this is especially going to be useful for, well, pretty much anybody that's concerned about quality, it's going to be useful for. But client-side managers and directors, if you're looking to set up a localization program and you're wondering what that's all about, and maybe working with a vendor to do that. Vendor side, 
localization program managers, quality managers, uh, it's going to be useful to you because a lot of times you're going to be the ones that those clients are calling to help you out with this. So basically anybody looking to learn a little bit more about language quality. Now, before we get back into it, I already said uh, if you're in the chat, make, make your voice heard. I, I will be bringing these up, up and off on and off the screen here. We'll be going over to the main chat page to, to look at what everybody's saying. We've got a lot of different people dialing in from a lot of different places today, so I'll try my best to get through all of that. But this is this is what we're doing. Make sure, make sure that you're taking advantage of the live format, I should say. And without further ado, well, I guess I should introduce myself. Who the heck am I? My name is Tucker Johnson. And I'm one of the co-founders of NIMSI Insights. I'm a co-owner of Multilingual Media, publishing Multilingual Magazine. Uh, I wrote a book. It's called The General Theory of the Translation Company, which is now available in audiobook format. So if you want to listen to this voice for six hours and learn something about the localization industry, then go check that out. It is available for free. You heard that correctly. It is available for free. Uh, there's a LinkedIn or a YouTube playlist uh, available via Multilingual Media's YouTube channel. And that is all thanks to our friends over at Lionbridge who sponsored that and made that possible. So if you want to listen to the General Theory of the Translation Company, go thank your nearest Lionbridge colleague because they made that possible for us. Uh, what else about me? Uh, I teach a little bit at different places, Middlebury Institute, University of Washington, I guess lecture a little bit, um, thanks to my friends over there, and of course, I'm the host of NIMSI Live. Now, I don't want, though, to say, you know, quality is not my, it's not my, it's not what I'm known for, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm taking credit for, you know, standing on the backs of others here, so big thanks to all of the NIMSI, the entire NIMSI team that's out there um, working hard to provide up-to-date research on the industry, working hard for our clients, providing that expert consulting in the industry, whether it's M&A advis advisory or you know, how to, you know, auditing localization programs and making recommendations, all of the work that you guys do out there. And also, and I didn't check with her before bringing her picture up on screen here, but I got to give a shout out to my colleague, Anna Colomina, who I've worked with for 10 years, yeah, that makes me feel old. Um, I've worked with her for about 10 years. Uh, she's a lot of the content that we're going through here today. I've, I've shamelessly stolen from work that she's done, putting together trainings and stuff for NIMSI clients. So thank you, Anna Colomina. Another shout out, I don't have her picture up here. Another shout out to Katka Gashava, who um, I don't know if Katka is ever going to watch this, but one of the... Um, one of the foundational people that I that really taught me about quality processes, um, even though I learned I probably wasn't the best student all of the time, Katka Gafshava and Anna Kolominas were um, key in helping me develop my knowledge and experience about language quality assurance, or LQA. What is in this workshop today? Who is it for? Like I said, this is for anybody who wants to learn about quality, um, client side, vendor side, Translators, reviewers, linguistic testers, anybody, you are all welcome, and you all have unique perspectives to bring to this, so please make those perspectives known in the, in the comments as we go through this together today. And also, I should say that this is, this is the first time I'm ever giving this workshop, and it's kind of my MO. I like to give these workshops. Uh, I will be giving this for a client as part of a larger thing that we're doing with the clients next I think within the in the next two weeks I have a specific client that we're we're putting this together for and I like to give these ahead of time as a live stream because um, basically it helps me practice and I really like that so if it's a little rough then that's the reason why um, Make sure to, like, for example, all of the fonts are screwed up on my presentation, and I don't know what to do about that. So, dress rehearsal, everybody. So, anyways, if you see anything that, um, any issues in the deck or anything that I've left out, let me know in the comments, and I'll fix that up so that when we deliver it for our, our paying clients, they get the full experience. 
Without further ado, though, let's jump right into it here and um, take a look at, well, I should, I should go over the agenda first. So this is part one. Um, there's a lot of content to go over when we're talking about language quality. Today we're going to be talking about part one, which is defining localization quality in the first lesson. And the second lesson is the beefy one. That's the long one, split, split up into a bunch of different parts. Uh, we're going to be looking at building a quality process, uh, split up into different phases, early phase, development phase, and the mature phase, which is taking a look at data data and reporting and um, ongoing management and continuous improvement for localization quality best practices. In part two, we're going to be taking a look at kind of some more specifics, like some of the tools that we can use for language quality. I'm not a tools guy. My colleague Yulia Kukova is our tools person. Talk to her if you want to go over the whole language technology atlas that we put out. We'll be looking at machine translation and quality, quality customization and cultivation cultivization, and just some general recaps, you know, some do's and don'ts and best practices. So that's going to be next week on Wednesday when, when we do this. So if you like what you hear here, if you like what you hear here today, then make sure to go sign up. That event is already live on LinkedIn, so you can go sign up for that right now and be notified when, when we go live on that. So let's jump right in to lesson one, defining localization quality. And we'll get right into it here. Um, I should not look at the comments because they're distracting. Yes, Michael, I have shaved. It's part of my weight loss plan. Um, lost several pounds by shaving that beard off. So defining localization quality, what we're going to be going over today is subjective versus objective quality, the relationship between localization and quality. And I'm sorry, that this is really bugging me with the font. Come on, Canva. Do better. Let me try something else here. Let me see if I can fix it. Oh, that's better. I'm going to do it that way. Okay. Duplicate. Doop -doop -doop -doop. And I love Canva. Those of you that join my live streams know that I love Canva. But the presenter view is not being nice to me today. All right, so defining localization quality, what's included in this section. We're going to take a look at subjective versus objective quality, the relationship between localization and quality, the importance of quality, different types of quality assurance. There are, you know, there are different methods for running QAs, analyzing quality factors in the quality environment, and what does quality mean to you? kind of tying back into that theme of subjective versus objective quality. So before we get too much further into this, we want to define some terms here. What is translation? What is quality? And what is translation quality? Objective versus subjective quality. Now you've heard you've heard these terms, I'm sure, before, and it's really hard to measure quality. Let's just take a second and recognize that before we get started here, is that when it comes to language quality, we're not talking about a product that has very specific bugs or features that either work or they don't work. Language is fluid. Language is alive. Language is inherently subjective. And this is one of our big challenges when we start talking about measuring and reporting on language quality is what is, what is objectively a mistake, a language error, and what is a more subjective feedback, you know, like, oh, I, I prefer this word or this term over that term. And this is, you know, we're going to be getting into this, especially when we get into lesson two here in the, in the second half of how to identify an actual issue versus a preferential issue. Translation, uh, tr when it comes to objective quality, uh, we can fall into the trap, and it's not so much a trap, but it, it's what we do, and it's, to a certain extent it's what we should do, is that when we're looking at translation quality, we're not just looking at language quality, right? The language quality is, does the end product sound good? Is it written well? So if I translate something from English to German, first of all, it's not going to be good. 
but I can I can look at that in two different ways. If I'm a reviewer, I can say, does this German sound good, and is it written correctly? Or I can look at it from the perspective of, is the translation good? And in order to do that, we need to actually look at it side by side with the English. And this is something that, as many of you know, surely, has caused quite a few challenges for for different localization managers out there. Because you say you have on the vendor side, you have a quality program that you're running, and you send it to the client. You send a translation to the the client, and they send it to one of their in in market people for review. Uh, just using the German example, they send it to their German marketing team and say, hey, can you please review this and let me know if this translation is good? A lot of times, that German marketing team, they're not going to open up the English and then open up the German and say, is the translation accurate? Is the translation good? They're just going to open up the German and they're going to say, well, I don't like this at all. And sometimes that's not because the translation is necessarily bad. Sometimes it's because the English was bad. Garbage in, garbage out, right? So we need to be careful when when we're we're talking about translation quality rather than just language quality. Because then we, if we're talking about language quality, we can get into this whole conversation about trans creation or in market copywriting, um, all of these different things. But that's not so much what we're talking about today. We're talking about translation quality, and we're also going to be using the the Taos standards quite a bit. Uh, because they kind of wrote the book on dynamic quality frame. Well, they literally wrote the book on dynamic quality framework, and they have set in place a lot of the standards that we've just kind of adopted as industry standards today. And a lot of people are using those. So translation, as as I was alluding to, is the process of turning an ori original source text. So we refer to the English. Well, I say English. Wow, look at me being very U.S. centric. Um, whatever, whatever the starting language is, we refer to that as the source text, and we translate that into the target text. And sometimes we translate that source text into many, many different target texts out there. Uh, the, in quality, the definition is essentially the degree of excellence of something. Is it, 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 does it fit the needs of the intended purpose that it was designed for? Is it getting the point across? If the text is meant to uh, convey a message, then is that message being conveyed um, faithfully and accurately? We put these together, and then we get translation quality, which is the degree of excellence of a target text in terms of end user satisfaction and compliance to the original source text intent and requirements. Now, a running theme throughout this today is going to be uh, what is quality, right? It, it's, it, sorry. A running theme throughout this today is going to be what is quality. Jeez, where, where am I? Sorry, this is what happens when I can't use presenter view. Because although I put these nifty little definitions right here, not everybody's going to agree. So let's say you're a vendor and you're providing translations to a bunch of different clients. What means quality for one client might not mean quality for another client. Quality for one client might be strict adherence to the source text. So is the meaning faithfully represented? quality for another client or even a different department within that same client, right? The legal department, and if you're on the client side, you know this, the legal department, if you translate stuff for them, they want strict adherence to terminology, strict adherence to the, you know, being faithful to the source text. And if you're working for the marketing department, translating marketing content, uh, or especially if it's you know short, you know snippy advertisement campaigns, stuff like that, then adherence to the source text isn't as as um, high of a priority as does it sound good, is it snappy, does it catch the user's attention? So the first thing you want to do is really take a look at what are the quality what what are the quality factors out there. And that's what we're going to look at now. If I get Canva to work. Oh, before we before we get into that, well, let's, let's get right into it though. Um, yeah, before we get into that, let's take a look at the the benefits of quality because you know I, I've kicked this off just talking about oh quality. That's that's great. We all need to 
you know, spend the next two hours or however long this is going to take learning about quality. Why is it important? And this is something for, for the linguists out there. Like this is this is a silly question. Um, linguists are owners, championed proponents of quality. If a job's worth doing, it's job worth doing right, right? Now it takes a little bit more convincing for for those of us project managers and you know people from other profiles people with profit margins um incorporated into our quarterly goals essentially because in my experience as you know project manager and localization quality i i was graded on profit margin how much money did i make for the company how efficient was i you know and amongst other things and sometimes margin can be at odds with quality. Quality, setting up a quality program and running multiple reviews when necessary, that, that is something that can definitely cut into your margin pretty, pretty quickly. And so, therefore, quality is often one of the first things to, to hit the chopping block when, when you're under a margin crunch and... Um, when you're under a margin crunch and need to shave some shave some expenses off there. So, for those of you project managers like me out there, why do you need quality? Quality gives you more ownership, greater transparency and brand awareness, trackable and actionable feedback, and believe it or not, time and cost savings. All of these leading to increased customer satisfaction, increased user adoption, and more profitable and efficient project management. More profitable and efficient project management. How does spending more money on quality lead to more efficiency? How does it lead to more profitability? Well, I'll tell you, quality done right the first time is a heck of a lot cheaper and a heck of a lot more efficient than having to go back and fix stuff. You know, think about, let's use the example of print. Like print, print materials are... Is, it's important to get the quality right the first time. Why? Because you're sending that translation to the printer and they're going to print 10,000 copies of something. Now, if there's a typo on the cover of the book or the brochure that you're printing and you've already printed 10,000 copies, you're not getting that back. You're not getting that money back. So that's going to be a lot of money to fix. Now, that's an extreme example. Not everything is print these days. In fact, most stuff is you can update on the fly. It's continuous publishing cycles and stuff like that. But still, um, think in terms of updating glossaries, updating style guides, updating TMs. A bad translation, let's, if you're working with, I don't want to say a bad translator, but let's say a translator that not delivering up to the standards that you would like them to be delivering and you're not running a quality program, you're not being proactive about spending money, investing into quality, then it's going to take you a little while to figure out that that translator is not delivering what you want. And by the time that you figure that out, maybe your translation memory is just chock full of horrible translations. Now you've got to pay someone to go back there and fix all of that. So when I talk about time and cost savings, that's what we're talking about here. Time and cost savings are real if done right for a language quality program. Now, we're looking at the whole language quality program throughout this workshop, but I need to call out there's different types of quality assurance because I've talked to a lot of different uh, enterprise localization professionals who are either currently running a quality program or looking to implement a quality program. We talk to them all the time here at NIMSI. And we start throwing about these terms like LQA. What is LQA, right? Language quality assurance, right? I don't know. Maybe it's language quality assessment, right? Two subtly different things. LQE, language quality evaluation. There's localization testing, localization review, linguistic review. What's the difference between localization review and linguistic review? Well, I would say, if, if you put a gun to my head, localization review is reviewing all... <sighs> it's reviewing the translated content in context and providing feedback on the full localization experience, whereas linguistic review may or may not necessarily be in context. Like think if you're you know, looking at 
product UI strings or something like that. Um, the list could go on. I could put a bunch of different acronyms here and a bunch of different terms. My main point, though, that, that I want to cover on this is don't assume you know what you're talking about when it comes to quality. Just don't. And what I mean by that is you might know what localization testing is. You might know what localization review is and linguistic review and all of these things. But the working definition in your head may or may not be the same as the person that you're talking to. So if you're talking to, if you're a vendor and you're talking to a client, if you're a client and you're talking to a vendor and you're talking about LQA, it always makes sense to say, stop, like, let's slow down. All right. We're having this big, we're having a great conversation about language quality assurance, LQA. What exactly does that mean? And then you could just have a quick conversation about it. Make sure that you're on the same page because you don't want to find out after the words, after the, the quality assurance has already been delivered that you're not meeting those expectations of the clients or that your vendors not meeting your expectations that you thought were clear because you didn't take time. So going beyond just talking about what is LQA, we can actually, and we absolutely should during those conversations, go deeper and say, what is quality? What is quality? And as I alluded to earlier, quality means different things for different people and for different uh, organizations, you're going to have different priorities. How do you find out what those priorities are? If you're a new globalization manager, director, you get hired by a startup tech company down in Silicon Valley. We'll just use that example. And they say, build me a quality program or build me a, they don't say quality program. They're just say, build me a translation program. They don't even know localization. So they're going to say, I want, I want to translate stuff, build me a program. And you, you want, as part of that, you want to implement a quality program. Well, what is quality? You need to figure that out. What is quality for your, that particular company that you're working in? One of the best ways that you can do that is talk to your internal stakeholders about that. Um, ask around. So if, if, you're asking your, if you're asking your internal stakeholders, then you're going to get the actual view of what is what are their issues what are their pain points so what are the most frequent errors that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis like when they get complaints from their end users what are those complaints about right what are the complaints about from their internal stakeholders what's the content like is it super dry and you know black and white or is it highly creative content do we need to use different quality definitions like do we have to have, should we have like one level of quality for help content and another level of quality for product content? These are all questions that we need to ask. Along those lines, we can take a look at different factors that are going to be... Where we would have oh, wow. less Yulia. false positive. I need to turn that off. Um, new setup, new studio, new setup. So my audio is not working necessarily um, well here. Um, some other things to bring up in your conversations with your st stakeholders. You know, what is the complexity of the types of content? Um, what is the relevance? What are, what have been some of the issues and past pain points? What are the different geographical markets that we're in? What are some of the specific complaints from each of those markets? You know, Germany is not necessarily going to be complaining about the same things that France is going to be complaining about. Well, they might be, or Japan or China is going to be complaining about. So the pain points are going to be different. What is the brand? Does your brand have a style guide? And if so, how does that style guide get localized into, into different languages? What are, what are the key things that are applicable in, in all languages when it comes to brand style and consistency? And what are some of the things that need to be localized? Um, tone. For example, it's always a good one. You know, there's, tone is very culturally dependent, and you might have a like nice, cool, slick tone in in English, but that's not going to work in different markets around the world. That in cultures that didn't, oh, thank you for pointing out the typos, guys. That's not going to work for a, a bunch of different markets around the world. So, to summarize our little introduction to quality here. Remember, it's always important to define your terms. Define your terms. What is LQA? What is LQE? What is testing? Um, what is quality? 
Like we may know that localization quality is quote unquote, the degree of excellence of a target text, but what does quality mean to me? What does quality mean to you? Figure out the Delta there and then come to an agreement. Remember that quality can, you know, obvious, well, we, we would all probably agree that quality can increase end user satisfaction, user adoption, um, all of these things because it's going to be a nicer looking text, nicer sounding text. But remember, it can also increase your margin. It can increase overall program efficiency. Perhaps not in the short term, but in the long term, it's going to help you out because you're going to be avoiding those mistakes that are super expensive. And with that, let's get in to the next, next chapter here where we're going to be taking a look at building a quality process, getting really into the meat and potatoes here. And this is, this is the beefy one that I'm going to try to get through in the next hour, 90 minutes. But it is broken up into three different parts here. So I'm going to talk to a little bit about, just give an introduction about best practices for quality assurance programs. So we're talking about building out an overarching program, not necessarily running individual LQAs. We're talking about building out an overarching program here. And then we're going to be splitting it up into different phases, um, creation phase, development phase, and mature phase. And each of those is corresponding to different um, sections here. We're going to be looking at onboarding, resourcing. So quality, quality is a human-driven thing. The machines have not caught up to us yet. This is one area where definitely the machines are, you know, machine translation. We can talk, we'll talk about automated quality checks, um, particularly next week and hybrid models and stuff like that. But right now it's still a very human driven thing. So how do we onboard the right humans for them? How do we define that quality as we were talking about? How do we plan for quality? How do we plan ahead so that we're taking a proactive approach to quality, not waiting for the issues to come in? And lastly, once we get to the mature phase here, we're going to be talking about how do we track and report that quality? How do we build a fully transparent quality assurance program so that all the stakeholders at any time can go on and really have an understanding of what quality is looking like for their program? I mentioned the three phases of the linguistic program setup. We're going to be looking at the creation phase, development phase, and mature phase. I think I've already covered kind of what goes into this, but really quickly in the creation phase, I, I really should be reading these slides because if people are consuming this as a podcast afterwards, I apologize. Um, if you are consuming this as a podcast, then make sure to check out Nimsy Insights' YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. But um, if you are listening to this audio only recording, then I'll just go through it. Uh, one, phase one, creation phase. This is where we do the linguistic team selection, test translations to test the translators. Uh, we, we meet the linguists. We talk to them. Linguists are humans. We, have, we build those human connections. We start the training. We have kickoff meetings. And we start building those linguistic assets, you know, thinking TM style guides, glossaries, uh, best practices, stuff like that. Moving into the development phase, this is where we define our QA framework. What is a QA framework? We're going to be looking at that. My laundry's done. That's the buzzer. Uh, setting up SLAs and KPIs. What are SLAs and KPIs? Service level agreements. Look forward. Service level agreements are metrics that we essentially commitments that we make. Uh, between a vendor and a client, let's say, on um, this is the level of service that you're going to get. KPIs are very similar, but they're more looking backwards. Um, measuring past performance or current performance. So setting up those defining SLAs and KPIs. And how do we actually roll this out? How do we deploy the LQA system, the LQA program? Moving into the mature phase, this is when we start looking at analyzing linguistic quality. So we're running LQA reviews, language quality assurance reviews. We have, we're have we doing that in an organized way. How do we actually use that data? How do we use that data to set up, make, make recommendations on how to continuously be improving the quality? And as part of that continuous improvement, we need to be looking at updating, continuously updating the assets. You know, TMs, glossaries, TMs stand for translation memory, of course. Um, 
TMs, glossaries, style guides, these are not static documents. These are living documents that need to be updated on an ongoing basis. And spoiler alert, this is where preferential changes, everyone hates preferential changes. Well, project managers hate preferential changes, I know. Um, but there's a lot of value to be had in preferential changes because they are an avenue for continuous improvement in localization quality. A quick overview of the, the quality process roadmap here, um, just kind of putting it into a visual phase here. We go from creation phase to development phase to ongoing quality management. And really, if I wanted to, um, I could turn this into a cycle because this is something you're not going to get to step 10 and have everything be done. There's always going to be work to do. There's always, you don't get to get to step 10 and then, and then fire your language quality manager and offboard the team and say, good job, guys. We'll see you next time we're onboarding a quality thing. No, it is certainly an ongoing process as, as the, the program always is maturing and evolving. So without further ado, let's dig deeper into what this looks like. Split this up into three sections. Wait, three sections or four sections? Four sections. We split this up into four sections. Let's go into lesson 2.A, resourcing and onboarding. What are the first things that we need to look at here? So in here, we're going to be talking about right fit resourcing, translation team specifications. Who do you want on your team? What credentials should they have? Uh, sourcing by content type. It's going to be... Um, We'll get into it. The standard localization quality team, what should that look like in steps for linguistic program onboarding? Right fit resourcing. What am I talking about? What is right fit resourcing? Well, I mean, in a sense, not to, you know, be anticlimactic, but but it's basically exactly what it sounds like. Are you getting the right people for your language quality program? Now, keeping in mind what we've already discussed. Quality means different things for different people. It means different things. There's different priorities for different brands. So quality, you know, the, the right people for one program might not be the right people for another program. So just keep that in mind. But in general, you're going to want to make sure that your linguists are committed. Not just your linguists, but everyone on the team. As we'll see a team structure in next slides here. But they're committed. They're accountable. Transparent. Predictable. Qualified, governed. Now, qualified is the step where a lot of us kind of stop. Well, I shouldn't say a lot of us. Qualified is the step where I, in the past, have made the mistake of stopping when it comes to selecting team members, um, be it for anything, language quality assurance or anything else. And don't don't stop at qualified. Just because they have the credentials doesn't mean that they're the right right fit for your quality program. You want to make sure that they're committed. You want to make sure that they're um, they're trustworthy. They're transparent. You know, they're they're not um, off doing their own thing. And you want to make sure that they're able to be managed. You want to have a governed, you know, a, a good governance program in place to make sure that everything's running in a repeatable way, in a scalable way, and that uh, information is filtering up and trickling down throughout the language quality program. Now, we can look at it in two different ways, too. We can look at it in terms of the translation team and the reviewer team. Translation is a different skill set related, but translation is a different skill set than review right some people i know some people that are great reviewers they can like smell a powerpoint slide and tell you that there's three typos in it some of you guys are in the comments today i see thank you very much um so don't make this mistake that um a lot of us especially when we're just getting into the language services industry make which is to think a linguist is a linguist is a linguist. You know, translation is not review, is not editing, is not testing, right? These are all different, is not post-editing. These are all different skill sets. So make sure that you have the right people for the job. What you have, what I have here up on screen is, is an example 
it's an example of of the type of team members that you, you'd want to get for a translation team or a reviewer team. So, you know, a translation team, two to five years translation experience, experience with the content type, experience with the cat tools that you're using, on and on and on and on. Reviewer team, um, you're going to want you know, you're some senior linguists on theirs with quite a bit more experience. And generally, generally, you know, we can fight about this, but generally you're going to want a little bit more experience on that review team. If you have to invest in, you know, the big guns, put those guys on the review team rather than on the translation team because they're the ones that look at the look at the, the content last. Um, and you could fill this out with different roles as well. You don't have to stop with just the translation review team. I think the main takeaway here is that you want to be intentional about who you're inviting onto your team. You want to be um, intentional about how you're building the team. You don't just want to take the first CVs that come across your desk. You want to be consistent across the languages to make sure that the right people are doing the right work. Another way of saying that is you want to source the right linguists by the right content type. So if you're running a localization program, you're going to have different internal teams that, as say you're on the client side, you're going to have different internal teams that are sending you content. You're going to get content from the marketing team. You're going to get content from the help the support user assistance ua team you're going to get content from the product team if it's you know software you can call that ui maybe there's a mobile app legal team hr all of these different stakeholders they all have needs to translate now not all content is created equal it's not the last time you're going to hear me say that which means you don't want the same person i mean necessarily Right. As a general rule, you don't want the same person doing your marketing content as is doing your legal content. Let's put it this way. Your, your stakeholders on the legal team don't want the same people translating the marketing content as the people translating the legal content. And certainly I could say the same about the marketing team. So keep that in mind. It's, it's not just we're going to hire one translator and one reviewer. For every language and be done with that. You're, you're going to want to make sure that you're taking into account the different content types. So I've been talking a lot about the linguistic team. Who, who is the linguistic? What is this linguistic team? And now, who am I talking to when I'm talking about linguistic teams? Am I talking to the client side folks or am I talking to the vendor side folks? Well, as with so many other things, it depends. It really depends. Um, some... Some programs have a largely outsourced quality model where they're outsourcing all of these quality tasks to their localization vendor. Some have a third-party QA model where they have a translation vendor, but then they have a completely separate vendor that's responsible for quality. I have feelings about third-party QA programs. Uh, I can tell you privately. Sometimes I, I generally don't think that they're that efficient. Let's just say, um, or you know, you could have there's there's programs out there where a lot of this quality stuff is managed on the client side. They they feel that quality is a core comp. You know, it, it's very important and it's not something that they want to outsource. They want to keep it in house. And this could make sense, particularly for brands with you know a strong brand, a strong brand identity. You know, no one knows my brand like we know. Our brand. It could also make sense for larger companies with a global presence. You know, if you have a team of brand experts on your marketing team in the Berlin office, then why why outsource that review to a vendor? Because of course, your marketing team over in Berlin is going to have a better idea about the brand than than you. So, all of that having been said, in general, you're going to want a language quality manager. You're going to want a separate person responsible for quality. So, you know, I was, I was giving a shout out to Anna Colominas um, earlier. Anna Colominas is an excellent language quality manager. And um, when I've worked with her before, she did not report to me. Um, I would say, say I was the program manager, program whatever I was. She was the quality manager. Now, she would work on all my accounts, but she didn't take orders from me. Much to my dismay, I would have liked it if she did, because there was this separation of church and state, right? 
because the ops guy is always going to be concerned about the the margin, the efficiencies, and quality needs to be somewhat independent of that. So there needs to be one person who that's their job is managing language quality. They can't have goals around margin and efficiency and stuff like that. There needs to be some of this healthy conflict, um, competing values going on, this give and take separation of church and state, as I call it. Now, under the language quality manager, you can have language leads. Uh, so generally, you're going to want, and you can call these different things, language leads, language champions, brand ambassadors, country ambassadors, country managers, market specialists, whatever you want to call it. But essentially, these are people that are um, much how the language quality manager is responsible for the overall quality management program. The language leads or the country managers, language champions, those are going to be responsible for their respective languages. So you want one guy, the language manager to, or gal, most likely, uh, to be responsible for the overall quality program. You also want one guy or gal responsible for Slovakian language quality, right? So everything that goes into you know, Slovakia, that market, gets reviewed or perhaps not reviewed directly if it's a large-scale program, but that's, that's the throat to choke if there's a quality issue, right? A lot of this comes down to accountability, like who's, who's, whose head goes rolling if there's a quality issue in Japan? Well, that would probably be the language manager for Japan, right? And, you know, I'm not saying chop off heads, but it, it's a figure of speech. Under that, you have the review team, and this can consist of a bunch of different reviewers, especially for large-scale programs. You're going to want different reviewers for different content types. That's why you can't just have a language lead, because that language lead might not be specialized in all of the different content types that you're going to be translating. And, of course, the translation team under that. And the translation team should really be working very closely with the, the quality management team. And that kind of tells you, uh, you know, one of my uh, challenges that I have with third-party QA programs is that I don't think they provide for that level of collaboration always. You know, they can, they can, but typically they won't provide for that level of collaboration between the actual translation team and the, the review team, the quality team. All of this, when we're looking at, you know, because we're talking about onboarding here, when we're looking at onboarding the, the, the language quality program, we can think of it in five different steps. And I put these five different steps into a circle um, and because it, it really is a continuous cycle. Because we start with the training, we develop instructions. Part of those instructions can be things like, you know, style guides, references. Um, we'll have a kickoff meeting a kickoff meeting with the language team. So we've, we've onboarded it. We've identified the team members. We've onboarded them. Now we're going to have a kickoff. Where, so we're all getting on the same page. We're going to make sure that there are channels in place for open, transparent communication, which is going to allow us to have a constant feedback loop. And if we think of this in a cycle, that feedback loop, that open communication um, feedback loop, that's going to be leading to ongoing training, updating the instructions, not a kickoff meeting, but ongoing syncs and update meetings. And I used to work on a, a program years and years and years ago where we would have once a year, a, a, what do we call it, a, a language summit or a vendor summit. And it was working for a large client. And we would get all of the, we would invite people from the each language team and we would invite people from the client. We would invite people internally, project managers and linguists alike. And we would all get together in person, back when we actually used to do stuff in person. In person, we'd fly them all out and we would share the costs, I think, between us and the client. I was working on the vendor side. And we would have these yearly meetings and we'd talk about things like brand and style and processes and tooling and efficiencies. And I can tell you, was it cheap? No. No, it wasn't. But that's going back to this idea of spend some money now, invest proactively so that you can avoid 
costly, costly, costly mistakes in the future. So you might not be having multiple kickoff meetings, but there's no reason why you can't you can't have ongoing meetings. And the cycle continues. All right, I think that brings us to the end of our onboarding phase here. So let's take a look at, let's review what we've gone over. Remember, right fit resourcing is not just are they qualified? Are they also committed, accountable, predictable, qualified, and governed or able to be governed? You know, some people aren't good team players. So make sure you're checking your team members for all of these things. Make sure that you're clear about the years of experience, special credentials, types of experience that you need from your linguistic team. Before you start, you know, before you go over to pros.com or prosy.com, I still don't know how to pronounce that, and start reaching out to translators, be intentional about it. What are the skill sets that you need? What are the content types? Because not all content is created equal. Different content types are going to require different linguists even if the overall subject matter is the same. So you're all translating towards one thing, but there's going to be different content types. You know, we use the example of legal and marketing, juxtaposed. Linguistic teams can, I say can, because you get, you know, you get to define your own linguistic team. Don't, don't let me tell you what to do. I'm just saying, you know, these are, these are some examples that, that work or that I've used before. And um, they, so they can, consists of a quality manager, language leads or country reviewers, market champions, um, reviewers, editors, translators, subject matter experts. You get to build that for yourself. Build one that works for you and your program. The how do you understand what works for you? And we go back to that, that first lesson there. You know, ask. Ask your stakeholders. What are their pain points? You know, ask your internal people. If you're on the client side, talk around. You know, ask around and... Um, Figure it out. Don't just assume. Don't make the mistake of assuming what works for one program will work for all programs, essentially. And lastly, we reviewed the steps, which is really a cycle of onboarding a linguistic program or maintaining a linguistic program or creating trainings, instructions, kicking off the program, deploying ongoing communication channels, and providing that constant feedback loop. So this brings us in here to our next section. We, we've covered the, um, we've covered, sorry, next slide. We've covered, covered the onboarding phase. Let's move into the development phase. There's gonna be two sections here talking through the development phase. The first one that we're looking at is building a quality framework. And we've kind of touched on a lot of these concepts before. We're gonna go in a little bit more in depth here. We're gonna take a look at analyzing quality factors. Gonna look at QA concepts and QA forms. So really defining what is quality and putting numbers to it, right? So what are the concepts and how do we put those into an actual QA form that is going to be filled out during the LQA process? Um, part of that is defining error types, severity levels, and really defining the weights, penalties, and thresholds for, for different issues and different errors that may come up. Now, wow. Lots of information on this slide. And trust me, as I was putting this deck together, I was wondering, how much time am I going to spend on this slide? Because I could spend a lot of time on this slide. Ugh. You don't want to do that, though. But this is really, you know, kind of building upon what we've been talking about a lot up until this point, which is taking a look at the different factors affecting quality and the different content types. Not all content types are created equal. So they're going to take different types of review, and there's going to be different recommendations. So for those of you listening over there on Spotify, um... We have a table here, four columns, with first column is content type, second column is the description of what that is, like what is included in that content type. The third column is the review type, so what type of review, or LQA, language quality assurance, should that get. And the fourth column is the localization and review recommendations. Let's just go through a couple here, just to take a look at it. So we see the... Um, 
first first row here is we have the content type is user interface, so UI. So it's a, it's a software product, either desktop, mobile, what, whatever it may be. And this description is you know, UI. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. The review type, we're going to be taking a look at standard review. So when I'm saying standard review, first of all, we've got to define that term, right? When I'm thinking standard review, I'm thinking of a review perhaps in the CAT tool, in the bilingual format, right? The, the review of the translation. And it's also going to need an in-context review. So, all right, we reviewed it in the standard review, in the bilingual format, in the CAT tool, presumably. Now, let's review it in the native format. So, we're going to take the translated strings, put them back into the UI, and then we're going to have someone either click through the, the localized build, we're going to recompile the, the whatever it is, or we're going to have our, our, our nerdy friends on the engineering team recompile that and take screenshots for us. And send those to the reviewers, which is also which is usually a really good option because that way you don't have language. You let the reviewers be reviewers, and, and don't let the reviewers be messing around with SDKs and stuff like that and building their own localized versions. Um, and test cases. So let's say they are messing around with an actual localized build. We're going to want to develop a test case, which is essentially telling the reviewer, "Okay, go to this screen, review." log bugs, and then click this button, review, log bugs, and then click. So it's going to make sure that the test case is what makes sure that the reviewer is being intentional and comprehensive and able to locate those strings for review. Especially, this is especially important during updates because if you know the product's already 99% translated and you send an update, well, the reviewer doesn't want to review the whole product again. They want to go directly to those strings. And some localization review recommendations for that is uh, short, concise, accuracy is key for some languages, most suited content for machine translation post-editing. That's true. You know, UI is you know, a lot is a good candidate for machine translation with post-editing for a lot of languages in a lot of situations. Uh, the user interface is usually very high vi visibility content, so spend some extra attention on it. You know, conduct those regular audits. That would be highly recommended. And more weight's going to be given to accuracy and consistency error types in the QA framework. And we're going to see what that QA framework looks like here in a little bit. And the table goes down. We have the same for documentation, instructional, user assistance, online help, marketing, legal, multimedia, transcreation. Um, I will remind you. Info at nimsy.com if, if you want to request a copy of this deck. Or I'll give you 10 seconds to take a screenshot right now. <laughs> I know you guys are. That's just fine. Five, four, three, two, one. Too late. We're moving on. All right. So QA concept and QA forms. Now we're getting into, we have our, our Taos logo down on the bottom right, credit where credit's due. Our friends over at Taos, um, they do many things, many things over at Taos. Um, if you like language and linguistics, and linguist, linguistics is one of your favorite words, and one of your second favorite words is data, then go over to Taos and check out what they're putting out. Um, or go, you know, go check out, I've had Yop on the program, Nimsy Live, a couple times, I think. You know, go check out some of our our past Nimsy Live streams. And I think Anne Mai is going to be on the program in September as well. We scheduled that one way out. So, But they're always doing interesting stuff over at Taos. But one of their, their big claims to fame their foundations here is the dynamic quality framework and really you know defining what is language quality and setting industry standards on this so we can we can follow a lot of what they're doing over at Taos without having to reinvent the wheel so one of the most important things is the DQF MQM frameworks um, so this is as I mentioned before DQF stands for dynamic quality framework and MQM stands for multidimensional quality metrics. I am not going to pretend to be an expert on either of these, but there are experts on the NIMSI team 
If you're an MZ partner, reach out, schedule some office hours with us, and we're happy to go through those or actually set up a workshop with your team that, that goes over these with someone who doesn't know what they're talking about when it comes to DQF, MQM. Um, essentially, in, in a nutshell, though, what we're talking about here is dynamic quality framework is what we've been saying all along. Not all content is created equal. Um, referencing the previous slide, there's going to be different practices and processes for different content types, but there's also going to be different expectations for different content types. Um, and we'll see more on that in a couple slides as well. Uh, my big thing that I'm not going to get into today, because today we're talking about language quality, um, kind of setting up a, a, a solid foundational language quality program. But more and more, the, the folks that we're talking to about quality here, particularly on the client side, at NIMSY Insights, when people call us and want to talk about quality, they're, they've got it. They've got the DQF, MQM. They've got all of that stuff. They've been doing it. They've got a mature, what you'd call a mature localization quality program. And now they're looking at how do we bring in the user? How do we bring the end user into the loop? And this is something that more and more programs are starting to do with customizing their quality programs with some sort of user experience element or sentiment rating. There are automated tools, particularly if you have large volumes or you're a well-known brand. There are sentiment analysis tools out there that can kind of give you snapshots that in an automated way um, using AI that can give you snapshots of what is the what is your brand perception in different languages out there. Um, there are focus groups, there are user surveys, there are um, here at NIMSY, we run focus groups and um, do polling and user surveys with end users of different products um, across languages to understand how is the language. Essentially, the answer that we try to do, and this isn't, I'm not trying to plug an NIMSY here. I'm just saying, like, this is one thing that people are asking for out there, which is how, so the localization is accurate. It's fluent, it's grammatically correct, it's all of these things. We know that because we have a mature language quality program in place. But how is the language, the localization, how is that affecting the end user experience? Right? That's the that's the question that a lot of folks are looking to answer right now. And it's a very, very fascinating question to try to answer. So and it can vary um, the, to the last point here. It can vary depend upon whether um, what content type it is. No one cares about the user experience so much from, you know, translating end user license agreements than they will if they're translating, you know, the product UI. You know, you want your app to have your app phone. You want your app to have a good user experience. Your help content. Well, I mean, you still want your help content to have a decent user experience, but I mean, let's be real. If if someone's reading your help articles, they're already probably irritated because your product's not working. So invest more in that product localization. Looking at a sample QA form, so talking about you know running LQAs. What does that mean to run? run an LQA to run a review. Well, typically a review is going to, it's not just, it's not editing where you're, you know, pulling it up in the cat tool source target and making changes. It's not just that. It, there's also a reporting element to it. So you're going to want to record, you know, what are you changing? Why are you changing? Why are you changing it? What are the issues that you found? So in order to do that, you put together a, a QA form. Now, there are translation management systems out there that have built-in review environments that can track a lot of this natively within the actual TMS, within the actual CAT tool, essentially. And those are getting better, I would say. Um, anyone from a TMS company in the comments now's your chance to plug your awesome features. 
But that's not what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about right now is just the traditional LQA form. Excel works fine, right? There's no, I've said this before and I'll say it again. There's no shame in using an Excel sheet for, for anything. And essentially what you're doing is you're defining your different error types so that every time a reviewer, an LQA reviewer finds an error, they're not just saying, I found an error. They're saying, I found an error. It is an accuracy error or it is a style error or it's an error with the design, whatever it may be. Uh, the error is a uh, level five severity. I mean, it's a big deal or it's not a big deal. So they're defining the severity of it. It's a major error, minor error, critical error. You want to do it. There's a lot of flexibility to be had in defining QA forms. Uh, we have some sample QA forms here at NIMSI. Uh, I'd be happy to go over, you know, or get someone who knows what they're talking about to go over with you for NIMSI partners out there. Um, but really make it your own. Make it your own. This goes back to, you know, every, every localization program is different. So track what's important to you, essentially. Oh, use formulas, too. That's the other thing about Excel is use formulas. Heck, use macros if, if you want to get fancy and really want to save your reviewers some time. Um, I mean, it, it, it's totally possible to do such things. Anyways, I'm not going to tell you how, though, because it's a pain. Just hire someone that knows how to write macros, essentially. That's that's my advice. Don't don't try to learn it yourself like I did. Going back to our buddies over at Taos. What air types do they recommend? Well, you see here accuracy, fluency, terminology, style, design, locale convention, verity, and of course other. Now each of these are high level air types. It can be broken down further with accuracy. Errors, you see additions, omissions. Oh, that's that's appropriate that there's no N on the end of omission. Um, addition, omission, mistranslation, overtranslation, undertranslation, untranslated text, improper exact TM match. These are all different accuracy errors. With fluency errors, those fluency errors can be punctuation, spelling, grammar, grammatical register, inconsistency, link cross-reference issues, Character encodings. These are all fluency issues. When it comes to terminology, we see inconsistent with the term base or inconsistent use of terminology. Essentially, just, you know, is, you know, there's inconsistency, but is it inconsistency with an actual agreed upon term or is it just inconsistency within the document or within the set of files? Style error types can include awkward style, um, not adhering to the company style. Inconsistent style, third party style, unidiomatic. Design issues can be length. And a lot of times there's character restrictions. A lot of times there's character restrictions, even that you don't know there are character restrictions until you slap it into the native format and create those screenshots that we were talking about and send those for review. Um, markup is a design issue. Missing text is a design issue. Truncate, truncation and text expansion. Once again, kind of related to the, the length there. Locale convention. These can be things like address format, date format, currency formats. Um, you know, a lot of internationalization issues in here if they're not caught in the internationalization phase. Uh, shortcut keys, telephone formats, culture-specific reference. Oh, under Verity, these are culture-specific references. Now, that's a rabbit hole that we can not go down today. I'll be doing another workshop on geopolitical and geocultural um, awareness review issues to be aware of. So stay tuned for that. But culture specific references are things like, you know, a one to one translation for a very culturally specific reference might not always work. Or the example I always use is, you know, if you're translating, uh, one time I was working on a project, we were translating an app about food and food and drink, right? And we just have to take out all of the references to alcohol in, I want to say Saudi Arabia, or in Arabic, let's just say, um, because, because nobody drinks in Arabic speaking countries, supposedly. So, you know, th things like that. Um, culture specific references are getting more and more complicated these days. They're all over the place, but it's something to be aware of. 
and that's why Taos has it as a specific air type. Looking at air severity levels, so you saw on the sample LQA form that we had earlier, you know, major, critical, or critical, major, minor, neutral errors, and we can define these into different severity levels, severity one, two, three, and four, with one being critical, two being major, three being minor, and four being neutral. And then there's a fifth air type called kudos, right? Once again, these are from Taos. Go check out Taos, get more information. But essentially here, the critical errors are like, oh no, this needs to be fixed. And this is something that's like, someone's gonna die, or the, the product's not going to work, or, you know, it's just, it's, it's breaking it. Like, it's critical, essentially. Major, one step down, so things that are misleading or confusing the user, there's a typo, awesome. Um, or have a significant change in the meaning, you know. Think like the translator wrote does instead of doesn't. You know, that's a major error, because it, it fundamentally changes the meaning of a sentence, to the opposite, right? Minor, minor errors, these are things that are gonna mislead or maybe confuse the person. Um, but I mean, they're definitely errors, right? They need to be reported, severity level threes. It's gonna decrease the quality, it's gonna decrease the fluency, but it's not fundamentally changing the meaning or it's not breaking the intent, essentially. Neutral, Neutral errors are basically used, you can think of like preferential changes are going to be logged as neutral. Um, these are changes that you don't want to count as errors, but they're suggestions for improvement, let's just say. So you don't want to like grade down the reviewer or the translator, but it's like, hey, I think we should do it this way. And of course, kudos, kudos are great. Kudos are where a reviewer gets to tell the translator because the reviewer is going through and just saying, hey, translator you made this mistake you made this mistake you made this mistake you suck right and kudos are a way to kind of soften that message and say hey at a boy at a girl good job you did you did a good job with this one so it's not all bad that's why i like and i always encourage if i'm working on a project um always encourage the reviewers to leave kudos wherever possible from a trust and team cohesion standpoint it just makes things go go smoother Talking about penalties and thresholds, now we get to now we get to look at all right, so we have error types, we have severity levels, so what? Right? The point of an LQA, filling out an LQA form is at the end of it, you're going to get a score, right? We saw that if we go back, we saw that on the, the cover sheet here where you get a final result and you get a final score. And of course, these are going to be formula driven. Well, what are the numbers driving those formulas? The, the numbers driving those formulas are coming from here, the penalties and thresholds and the weights that you assign. And this is where the dynamic part of the dynamic quality framework comes in is you might want to assign a heavier weight to a stylistic error, you know, stylistic category error for marketing content than you would for legal content. No one cares if your legal content is stylistically fluent. They care if it's accurate, right? Um, you might want to grade different errors at different severity levels and grade different severity levels at different weights, depending upon the content type as well. You know, the, the canvas is blank. You can paint it how you want. But this is why it really makes zero sense to talk about pass-fail rates um, between different localization programs. Like if I'm talking to, if I'm running a quality program for client A and I'm talking to a colleague who's running another client program for client B, it makes no sense for me to say, well, we set the threshold at an 85% pass rate because what is pass rate and how strictly are you rating things? What are the weights, right? Um, the other person might be setting it at a 95% pass rate, but their actual weights that they allow and um, what constitutes a pass might be completely different. Um, so makes it 
makes it not only difficult, but just kind of pointless to talk about that, unless you're using the exact same weights, the exact same definitions, the exact same severity levels on the exact same content types. It's it, You're always going to have an apples to oranges comparison across LQA programs. So essentially, when we're talking about penalties here, penalties are... <sighs> I mean, I don't know how much how else to say it. I think you guys get it. Penalties are how much weight different air types are going to have, right? So these are all formula driven. So when people are logging, when the reviewers are logging errors in the LQA sheet, there's going to be a formula that calculates that and calculates that that score, that final score on that that cover sheet that we just saw. And essentially, these are the coefficients that we're putting into those formulas, essentially. One thing to note is that when you are setting these thresholds, these penalties, you'll want, you'll want to have a minimum amount of words because if you're, if you're reviewing 50 words, because, and here's why, because that final score, one of the other factors that goes into the calculation of that final score is how many words were reviewed. You can't just say there were five issues. That means nothing. If you find five issues in a text of 10,000 words, eh, that's pretty good. If you have five issues in a text with five words, well, start rethinking your life because that's pretty bad, right? So the amount of words really matters. Now, the, the fewer the number of words, the more weight inherently each issue is going to carry, regardless of what penalty or of what weight you assign to it or what severity you assign to it. So generally the best practice is if you're running an LQA project, try to include at least a thousand words in there. And this makes it unfeasible to run LQA projects specifically for every single handoff, particularly in like continuous publishing cycles. Um, or ongoing localization, you know, with lots of small, tiny drops in there, you're going to want to aggregate content into one place so that you can, so that you can have a minimal, a minimal volume to, to review. I'm hoping I explained that well enough. So for consideration, different, con different types of contents require different types of QA. I've said it many times. Industry standard QA concepts like TAUS are a great place to start when developing structured QA forms. QA forms should be standardized and formula driven when possible to allow for apples to apples comparisons between review cycles and between languages. Some errors are more critical than others and that's why issues should be logged according to severity level, you know, critical, major, minor, neutral, and kudos. Defining structured weights for air types and severity levels feeds into the final LQA score. And thresholds for passing LQA can be defined based upon language content type as well. So that kind of brings us to um, the end of section 2B here. Next we're going to be getting into, we're still in the development phase, but we're going to be looking at quality assurance planning. Before that though... I just wanted, like I said, I do not have a an operator with me today, but I do want to kind of go look at some of the chats, see if there's anything here that I'm missing. Hot take. I love hot takes. Michael Dutton, hot take. Translator as freelancer equals margin driven and striving for quality while being pressured by third party margins. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I would agree. People are still obsessing over my beard being gone. RIP beard. Uh, someone please share the link for this YouTube channel. And I see Michael Dutton did. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> oh, someone shared Anna Colominas' LinkedIn. Yeah, go follow Anna Colominas. Um, She's rad. Follow Katka Gosheva too. Katarina Gosheva. Uh... Awesome. All right. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot of questions. So let's let's trudge on here, shall we? Talking about language assurance planning. So here, 
Are you running a QA on Tucker's presentation? Yes, you guys should be. Like I said, this is the first time I've given this. Thank you, Oscar. So feel free to point out the typos. I've asked people to do that. They're not just being jerks. I've asked people to point out issues with this uh, because this is actually developed for um, for a client of ours, and they're paying me for it, so I want it to be better. Um, you guys are getting it for free, so you get the typo version. So, yeah, rip it to shreds, please. Alrighty, in this lesson, talking about QA planning, we're going to – Talk about holistic approach to quality. There's a buzzword for you, holistic. We're going to look at different QA methodologies, kind of dive deeper into what we've already talked about back when we were defining our terms. Look at different KPIs. Briefly look at different KPIs. Like we could have, we could have a whole workshop just upon language quality, key performance indicators, service level agreements, reporting, dashboarding, all of that stuff. It's not really what we're doing here today, so we're gonna, but we're going to look at it. We're going to talk about the importance of it and take a look at style guides. Which, I mean, really, we should have talked about style guides probably in the last section, but eh, better late than never. What do I mean by quality as a holistic approach? So when we're talking about quality, we're not just talking about review. We're not talking about filling out a QA form, right? In order for a review to be meaningful, indeed, in order for a review to take place at all, there needs to be structure provided. There needs to be management, right? There needs to be agreements in place, um, particularly not, not so much for, you know, small projects. I'm talking about for localization programs with ongoing work, Presumably between a client and a vendor, you know, a same vendor or same set of vendors and a client. So we're talking about building out the quality quality program. So this is, um, and there's different tools that can be used for this. So quality management, you can, in any, I say JIRA just because JIRA is the one that everyone knows, right? But you can use any bug tracking tool for quality, um, for logging bugs, logging issues. Like I said, there's no shame in Excel. There's really no shame in Excel. Right, especially if you get some fancy macros or use some scripts, you know you can have, you can have your you can define your LQA review worksheet spreadsheet, and then write some scripts, write some macros where you slap that in a folder. It automatic the data automatically gets pulled into a master sheet, into different for in everything's formula driven, and it updates a dashboard or a graph in Excel, what, whatever it may be. There's a Power BI instance links to that. So, I mean, you can get you can use whatever tool you want. But Jira, everybody knows Jira. A lot of people know Jira, I should say. Instructions management. So it's not, it's not enough just to write uh, instructions, you know, your, instructions to your translators, instructions to your, uh, to your reviewers. It's not enough just to, um, and it goes to the last point here, glossary and style guide management. It's not enough just to create glossaries and style guides and do not translate lists and all of these different things. They need to be managed because if no one knows where the instructions are, if new linguists don't know where they are that you onboard, or if old linguists can't remember, then what good are they doing yet, right? So make sure that there's a shared space. You can use SharePoint. You can use Google Drive. You can use you can use whatever you want. You can use your own server, but make sure that there's a shared point that everybody has access to, and it's easy for them to access it, right? It's convenient. Um, there's not like nine different logins that they have to remember. Um, I like to use whatever environment is closest to the people that are u utilizing it, right? Don't make people work in another tool, right? So if you're already using SharePoint for a different aspect of your localization program, then use SharePoint for this. Don't make, um, you know, don't have some of your files in Box and some of your files in Google Drive and some of your files in SharePoint. Um, put them all in one place. So LQA management, you need to define, we need to define what is the cadence. So what gets QA'd, what doesn't get QA'd, and what's the frequency to go with that. And lastly, the glossary and style guide management. So all of these are things that are, and more, of course, there's more that I could list. 
um, that go into a holistic language quality project. Now, we talked about this in the first, in one of the very first slides. We talked about there are different types of methodologies. We use the example of what is LQA? Is it language quality assurance or is it language quality assessment? Uh, what is the difference between LQA and LQE? What is testing? What is localization review versus linguistic review? All of these different things. Um, so now we're going to go a little bit deeper into this, talk about standard review, stakeholder feedback, testing, in-context user groups, user surveys, self-certifications. Um, let's look at more on the next slide. So this is another beefy one. Get your screenshot software out if you want to copy this. Or info at nimsy.com, request that deck if you want. And whoever is answering the info alias probably hates me right now. I'm sorry. Um, so different, some different types of QA methodologies, and I'm not going to read every single cell in this table. But for those of you listening, I will describe it. So we've got a table with six columns here, broken out by the, t the QA method, and then looking at what type of QA is that, and then the what, why, how, and when of it. So We've talked about this standard review previously. Well, just like we need to define what is LQA, what is uh, what is quality, for that matter, we need to define so that all stakeholders agree what is a standard review. Um, well, let's go down the list of different QA methods first. So we've got standard review, we've got internal stakeholder feedback, testing, and context review. Oh, the same stuff as on the previous slide. Uh, user groups, user surveys, and self-certification. So let's talk about standard review going across that. So the QA method is standard review. QA type is quantitative versus qualitative. The what is regular source versus target. And it's going to be reviewed on a percentage of localized content. So standard review would be like, we're not going to review 100% of the words that are translated. Right? We're going to review 10% of it because our goal with a LQA is not to provide a full review. Presume, hopefully that review has already been done by the translation vendor. It should be a two or three step review process with the translation vendor. So the goal isn't that. The goal is to understand the overall quality. And you can, if you've got 10,000 words that are translated, you can review 1,000 words and understand, okay, this is a good translation. You don't need to read the other 9,000. So that's what that means. Uh, so the what, the why is a reliable way of checking against quality baseline and linguistic QPIs. The how is recurrent standardized reviews by experienced reviewers. And the when is recommended monthly audits on a percentage of the content. Once again, suggestions. Right? Like your program might look different and you're not wrong and I'm not wrong, right? But these are the type of stuff that as you're developing a quality framework, a quality program, you're going to need to sit down and define, right? The budget might not call for monthly audits. You might not have that in the budget. You might want to do quarterly audits. You might want to do it on 5% instead of 10%. For high priority, high visibility content, you might want to do it on 20%. You might want to do full review. I, I've worked on projects like that before where we actually did do a full review, 100% of the content for high priority stuff. So make it your own. Now I'm going to skip all the way down to the bottom and talk about self-certification. So self-certification, QA type is quantitative and qualitative. Uh, the what is localization vendor submits proof of QA to certify their quality has been executed. The why is delegating quality ownership to the localization vendor allows the client to focus on higher level areas of the quality program. The how is recurrent standardized reviews by experienced linguists on the vendor side. And the when is recommended at specific milestones. Delightfully vague. There. And I want to talk a little bit about self-certification because I kind of talked some smack about third-party LQA programs earlier, and I will continue to talk smack about third-party LQA. I somewhat joke, right? There's there's very viable, good situations where a third party program makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm, I'm more just joking, for the, so don't take me too seriously, please. But I like these ideas of self certification because self certification is essentially saying, "Look, vendor, you know, I'm on the client side. I'm talking to my vendor or vendors." 
if I have a multi-vendor strategy. And I'm saying, I don't want to pay a third vendor to come in and QA your stuff. And I don't want to do that because it doesn't make sense. I'd have to train them on all of the stuff that I trained you on. And I'd have to make the assumption that their linguists are actually better than your linguists because they're going to be having the quote unquote authority to, to review the feedback. Um, secondly, it's, it's, it's inefficient. There's a lot more, it, it adds to the process. It adds to the timeline and it adds to my costs, right? Likewise, I don't want to develop a quality program in house. Like I could send this stuff to be reviewed by my in-country marketing teams, but that's not their job. Their job is marketing in country. And they're always going to deprioritize anything that I send to them. And it's not fair for me to do that. Um, furthermore, I don't want to hire in-house language champions because, you know, I'm just going to say it, hiring in-house language champions, it's, it's usually a bad idea. And here's why. Because once again, you're making that assumption that that one person that you hired to be your, you know, Spanish in-house language champion, that one person is actually better qualified, better experienced, and better than all of the people on your vendor side, right? And just the odds of probability are that if you hire one person, just the probability dictates that that person's not going to be better than all of the experts. You know, we went through the list, the language quality manager, the language lead, the review teams, the translators that, that are working in your supply chain. And furthermore, and here's the big reason, here's the big reason is because now you've got an employee sitting in your office that you're paying a lot of money to, and it's your job to keep them busy. Every hour that they don't have something to review is an hour that you're paying them not to do something. So it adds to the, adds to the complexity that you now have an additional person whose time you have to manage. And it also adds to the risk that depending upon where you are, what your company's policies are, and you know what market or country and regulations you're, you're subject to, if that person isn't good, well, now you got to get rid of them. And that can be, that can be challenging. Um, it can be challenging and it's heartbreaking. It's bad for morale to be hiring and firing people all the time. Better to let the vendors take care of it. Make it, make it the vendor's problem. Make it the, the LSP's problem. But this idea of self-certification is saying, hey, I'm not going to hire a third-party LQA vendor. I'm not going to build something in-house. But I want you to self-certify. I want you to self-certify your quality. And here's what that's going to look like. It's going to be, be built largely on trust, or I'm going to trust but verify, right? Is Here's what that's going to look like, is you're going to run, you know, all of that stuff that we had on the previous slide here, right? Uh, well, a few previous slides ago, I should say. Oh, shoot, no, I've lost myself. Okay. Um, all of that stuff that we had before, it's going to be 10%... Um, of the content is going to be reviewed on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, whatever it may be. Here's the thresholds. Here's the penalties, blah, 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 blah. But you're going to do it and you're going to provide me reports and you're going to verify that you're using third party um, reviewers, right? So the reviewers that you're going to use are going to work for a completely different sub vendor or they're going to be a completely different person with no ties to the people that are actually working on, on the translation work. So that's what self-certification is. And when you roll out a self-certification program, originally you're going to want to, you know, you're going to want to be pretty nosy and reviewing everything and, um, you know, like I said, trust but verify. So heavy on the verify when you first roll it out. But the idea is that over time you can stop verifying so much and it turns into instead of reviewing every little thing, you know, you're checking in once a quarter to make sure that your vendor is still doing what they're doing. And it becomes more of a trust-based thing. Saves time. It's efficient because you've got your vendor worrying, worrying about it, not you. And it, you don't have to worry about onboarding another vendor. You don't have to worry about bickering between vendors because if you hire a third party LQA vendor, you know, I, this is you know, just, it, it bears saying if you hired a third party LQA vendor, that vendor, what do they want? Do they want to be your third party LQA vendor? in five years? No, they want the translation. That's where the money is. They want the whole shebang, 
right? So we already have a situation where the there's a conflict of incentives, right? You have a QA vendor that's essentially Q incentivized to find issues, not incentivized necessarily to make sure the translation is great and the program's running smoothly and efficiently, but they're incentivized to find issues. And let's be real, they're incentivized to make that other vendor look bad because they want to steal that work one day. So, it, it, so there's a practical piece of advice for you all out there. If you ever are hiring a third-party LQA vendor, put it in the contract, like tell them, look, you're not getting the translation work ever. If you if we hire you as an LQA vendor, you're not getting the translation work. Takes that incentive to make the other vendor look bad right off the table. Um, so that's my advice to you when it comes to third party LQA. All right, I've ranted enough about self certification and third party LQA. I want to talk about not all languages being the same, at least when it comes to measuring quality. Now, originally, this slide says not all languages are created equal, which I'm like, well, that's going to get me in hot water. So um, not all languages are the same because, of course, all languages are equal. They're all great, but they're not the same. And we're going to talk about this in terms of language maturity. And by maturity, I need, I need to be clear here. Um, cause I'm, you know, the intent is no disrespect towards every, every language is beautiful. Like I just had Tim Brooks on Nimsy live last week. I think Tim Brooks runs the endangered alphabets project and he does a lot of work. And I think their fundraiser, their spring, spring fundraiser is still open. So go donate if preserving endangered languages is something that's important to you. Um, but not all languages are, have the same level of maturity. I mean, just think of it in terms of this, uh, there's, Languages that have highly codified, I just want to make sure we're still streaming here. Is that, are we still live? My, my thing went dark. Someone tell me in the comments and I'll keep talking. Um, there's languages that have very mature uh, dictionaries, you know, governing bodies that say this is the correct way to do this language. This is not the correct way to do this language. Um, here's the spelling. Here's the scripts. Here's the grammar. And everybody can agree on it. There's also languages out there that just don't have dictionaries. Like there's no standardized ways of spelling things. And those can be more challenging to QA. So that, that all needs to be taken into account. And so the example that I have here is how do you spell Nimsy? Right? Nimsy is uh okay, thanks, Bob. Uh Nimsy is a Fanti word. It's a, it's a language dialect from West Africa, and it's a Fonti word that means knowledge. And when we were when we decided to name our company Nimsy, we were like, "Well, how do you spell Nimsy?" I don't know. And nobody could really give us a straight answer on that. In fact, nobody could re even really give us a straight confirmation that Nimsy means knowledge. Yeah, it does now because we say it does. Um, but and that's our story. But this kind of presents a great example in a case study of like if I was a reviewer and I was translating the word knowledge into Fanti, there's other words that could be used. I remember Nyansa was a word that came up. Any Ghanians in the audience in, in the comments, please elaborate, um, inform us. But if you're working in a language that isn't mature, that needs to be taken account into the QA process, essentially. So... The way that you do that is by adjusting your KPIs accordingly. And here we have, you know, languages, for example, split into different language tiers. Language tier one, two, and three, with the maturity being labeled as one high, two medium, three low. And some examples are high maturity languages being European languages. Most European languages have standards and governing bodies and things like that. Brazilian, Portuguese, Japanese, Chinese is is pretty standardized, highly standardized. And so for these, you know, these are, you know, standard. And it doesn't, won't take that much time to on um, to onboard them. You can set your KPIs, your threshold's pretty high on these. For medium maturity languages, language tier number two, we have um, languages like in, Indic language, Indian languages, East Asian languages, 
and for these, you know, you can onboard these in relatively the same amount of time too, but you might want to adjust your key performance indicators. So instead of having a fail rate of, you know, 85% being fail, you might want to say uh, 80% is fail. So it kind of lower the expectation a little bit. You're going to want to add a little bit of a buffer for um, review tasks just because the supply chain isn't there, the, the resources aren't there. And it, it specifically, especially for for tasks that are kind of highly specialized. So if you're doing in-context reviews or working with special assets or you know things like that, just allow for some extra time, allow some flexibility because it might be harder to find that expertise in, in those particular languages. And lastly, we got to low lower maturity languages so african languages native american languages a lot of these languages are um in danger well i mean check out check out my my live stream with tim brooks because like we go into this like what makes a language low maturity um so check out that podcast i don't know if it's hosted yet as a podcast but search nimsy tim brooks and so for lower maturity languages, you're going to want to, you know, they're going to take longer to onboard, first of all. They're going to take longer to onboard. Like, don't believe me? All right, go find me an Inuktitut translation team. And then find me a review team. <laughs> right? Go find me, uh, yeah, I fill in the example. Um, we just, I have a client right now or they were bugging me about it. I think they gave up on us um, looking for like five different languages that they could just not source, right? And there's LSPs out there that specialize in these hard to find languages. And this is where I think the regional multiple language service provider really comes in handy. You know, don't source your own African languages. Go with a regional provider. I don't care if you're an end client or if you're an MLSP or if you're an SLP or single language provider. Even... <laughs> If someone's asking you for, you know, five different African languages, just go to the experts on that. Pay the premium because otherwise the vendor management becomes a nightmare. So that's that. I want to go back to the comments here because I thought I saw some comments. Mm -hmm. Will you mention some alternative solutions, alternative to Excel? Oh, <sighs> As far as, I think that's in the context of that, well, who's asking this? Gleb Grabowski. Um, so I think we were talking about Excel, using Excel for LQA forms. Now, the alternative, the best tool, I'm not, I'm not going to give you too many alternative solutions because, I mean, you can duct tape anything into, into to fit the purpose of measuring QA or recording QA and stuff. Um so, for example, I mean, you could you could customize Jira really into use doing all of this. You could customize. I mean, there's different project management tools out there. You know, Smartsheets comes to mind. Um, there's so many things that can be built into creating LQA forms and feeding that into an automated process. I say Excel because most people know Excel, right? And if I'm working on a program that's doing 20 languages for 30 markets and I'm reporting quality for all of those markets or at least all of those languages or at least a part of those languages, right? The high priority languages, tier one languages, then I'm working with, and for each of those languages, I have at least one translator, one editor, and one reviewer, Right, so thirty language, thirty markets times three—that's ninety different individuals, and I don't want to train anybody on how to use a tool. Right, not ever, not all of those people, particularly for your low priority languages. Right, not all of those people are going to know how to use Jira. Not all of those people are going to know how to use a cat tool, frankly. For your tier three languages, your lower maturity languages, like don't expect that your um, Native American translators are going to be working in world server with you, 
that's not a reasonable expectation to have. So I don't want to train them on a bunch of other tools, but most people know how to use Excel. And that's why I say Excel. When it comes to other tools, I, I can encourage you to check out um, the, it, well, we'll be talking more about tools next week when we get into part two, but I can encourage you to check out the Language Technology Atlas, also called the Language Technology Landscape from NIMSY. It's, it's on the main landing page. So just go to nimsy.com, scroll down. I guess I can, I can bring it up here. If I, you can just go to nimsy.com and here in, you can just scroll down. And here's the language technology atlas, read more. And there's, there's a very nice write up by my colleague, Yulia, of course, and, and Sarah and Belen also worked on the Sarah Hickey and Belen Aguyo Garcia. And this splits out language technology. So I think we've identified like over seven, I want to say over 700 different technologies and broken them out into different categories. So translation management system, integrations, marketplaces and platforms, interpreting, um, BMSs, audiovisual, machine translation, speech recognition, and ding, 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 quality management right here. So these are some third-party tools. So my, my priority, if this is just my opinion, on if I was going to use a tool. The first tool I would use is something like Excel because it provides me more control and I don't have to train my supply chain on using a specific tool. The second priority I would do is a third party tool like what's listed under here um, that's specifically designed with quality assurance or quality evaluation in mind, preferably one that's either a plugin or integrates with my existing TMS. My third choice would be to use the native quality management features directly within a TMS. And that's just because, and this is, you know, hot take right here, like they're not there yet. I, I think TMSs, TMSs are getting better every single year and they do a lot of things really well. Um, one of the areas where I don't think that they're going to be great at ever really is the quality management and quality review in the LQA and I'm sure that's going to anger people watching this, some people. But here's why. Not because they're not good at what they do, but because all of the stuff that we've been talking about. Quality is dynamic. Quality doesn't mean the same thing for every client. So it's very hard for a company like XTM. XTM does a great job as far as TMSs go. XTM does a great job as far as having quality and review features built into their system. Right. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it next week when we get into part two. But nobody's ever going to be able to build one tool that meets the needs of every language quality program for all of the reasons that we've been talking about here because it, they're so different. So that's just all a fancy way of not answering your question, I think. Thank you, Fabricia. Going back to the comments, thank you, Fabricia, for the typo pointing out. Uh, what should, um, Syed says, what should the volume, what should be the volume for considered for an LQA percentage? So what volume would be a good percentage for an LQA? Standard 10%, 10%. So, um, I would, but I would say 10% or 1000 words, whichever. So because you want that 1,000 word threshold. So let me explain. If I'm doing a project with 100,000 words, then a standard LQA, at least in my estimation, would be 10% of that. So I would LQA 10,000 words. And I would try to take those 10,000 words from different places. I wouldn't just, con you know, I do blocks of 1,000 words. I wouldn't just do like the first one 10,000 words, right? So that's 10%, right? Now, if I was doing an LQA of 5,000 words, I would do 1,000 words, which is actually 20%, right? 1,000 of 5,000 is 20%. So I'm going above, but that's because I want to get that minimum threshold of 1,000 words. If I go below 1,000 words, then my severity level, my, my penalties and my severity levels, they, they get really wanky. It gets really wanky, wonky. It gets really wonky because um, that's, you know, 
one error accounts for more when you're only queuing 100 words than it would if you're queuing a, th queuing a thousand words. Because at, at the end, when you're calculating that final score, you're taking the total number of errors, you're multiplying them by multipliers based upon your QA framework and your severity levels, and then you're dividing by the total word count reviewed, right? So the lower that word count, the more sensitive the calibration is on the final score. Cool. Thank you. Um, Oscar, these QA people can't help themselves. Fabricia. Uh, Oscar asked Fabricia if she's running my QA presentation. She probably should be. She probably should be. All right. Um, I'm done getting distracted with chat. Where was I? Oh, yes. KPIs per language group. And I think we spent enough time here. So, I mean, I've already said all this. Therefore, because not all languages have the same level of... I kind of hate this. You know, I might change this. I hate this talking about language maturity because it seems like I'm making a judgment call about different languages. Um, so, I'll, I'll try to find a different term for that. But because not all languages have... Um, equitable representation of governing bodies, then they shouldn't be held to the same standard, essentially. I think we've covered that. So go easy on your Cherokee linguists, guys. A, because they deserve it, and B, because there's not many of them, so don't piss off the ones that you know. Some style guides, probably should have talked about this in the previous section, but I can't go through an LQA program presentation without talking about style guides. We don't need to go too much in depth in here. I think um, most of the folks in the audience are going to understand what a style guide is. It's essentially a codified um, guide to style. And, you know, if, if you're working on a project where you have one translator, and that's it, one translator translating your content, well, that translator, you know, th they know what the voice is. They know what terms they've used before. They know what tenses to use. They know the formality that needs to be used and the general grammar and style and all of that stuff. And so the, the need for a style guide isn't really there. Now, the larger the program, the more the need for a style guide is. Think about it. If you need to translate 100,000 words in five days, you can do that. You can do that with some vendor management and project management. You just split up the work to a bunch of different translators. Hopefully, you're translating in the cloud with real-time updates to the TMs and all of that stuff. Um, but it can be done, but it's going to require multiple and multiple translators working on that content or just robust and good MT output. Um, or combination thereof, right? Now, if you have multiple translators working on a same, the same body of text, and that body of text is going to be delivered at the same time, first of all, try to have one reviewer reviewing everything to check for consistency of style and everything. But, you know, you can't always even have that. This is where a style guide comes in handy. Because you can tell all of the translators and train all of the translators ahead of time, this is the style that you need to use. This is the style when it comes to, you know, just general style, grammar. Here's how we format dates. You know, here's how we format punctuation. Like, are product names capitalized? I mean, just something like that, right? Just something as simple as that. Are product names capitalized? If there's no agreement and that agreement isn't recorded into a style guide, then mistakes are going to get made, essentially. So on here on screen, you see just a simple beginning of a style guide um, table of contents format outline, I should say. So wrapping up this section, Lordy, we're not going to make it in under two hours, guys. Sorry. So if some of you guys have to drop off, well, I mean, whatever. Um, but looks like this is going long. I apologize, but we're going, going to end here with um, reviewing the last section. So talking about this planning, we've been talking about QA planning, quality management planning. Um, comprehensive QA planning means a comprehensive or in other words, holistic approach to quality, including quality management, instructions management, LQA management, and glossary and style guide management. 
there are different types of QA that should be employed in different scenarios. So we've got today we reviewed standard review, internal stakeholder review, testing, in context review, user groups, user surveys, self certification. Um, there are others. You can find others. It's fine. Less mature quote unquote languages can have less stringent thresholds and penalties assigned to the LQA and the KPIs and how they're scored. And of course, we just talked about style guides and how they're important to make sure. All team members, including quality managers, language leads, reviewers, translators, etc., are working with the same expectations for each target locale. And with that, I want to give you guys a quick check in here because we've got through, I think, f 43 slides out of 60. Oh, we're going to do it. We're going to charge ahead here. I can be quick in this last section because it gives me an excuse for not having very robust slides about the business intelligence part. So we're going to talk about um, reporting quality. And for those of you that only plan two hours from this, we will see you next time. Thank you for joining. Um, I appreciate you. But we are going to finish this up in the next 10, 15 minutes. So do not worry. So talking about reporting quality, monitoring quality. Uh, we're going to break this down into why. Why do we want to do this? We need to be pro. It's because we need to be proactive. We're going to talk about self-certification versus in-house versus third party. We've already covered that, so we can go light on it. Uh, we're going to talk about deciding the scope of the LQA. We're going to talk about, and here's where we could really go down a rabbit hole, but we're not going to, the linguistic data BI, or business intelligence or BI dashboarding presenting data. And lastly, preferential versus quote unquote real quality issues. Now, when we're talking about reporting quality, why report quality? Why is it so important, right? It's important to have a managed program, right? And it's important because you need to be able to track the trends. What is, is the quality trending upwards or is it trending downwards? Why? For what languages, right? And essentially, it all comes down to we need to detect the issues before they arise. Think about it. Let's, let's go to an extreme here. Let's use the extreme of full QA of everything and full reporting of everything or no QA whatsoever. There's, there's no reporting, no QA. Now, in the full reporting of everything, then everything is going to be great. Everything is going to be perfect because you're having it reviewed and mistakes are going to be fixed 100%. You're not even doing a sample. You're just doing 100%. It's like inefficient. Inefficient, right? Now let's go to the other extreme of no QA, no reporting. Well, if you're not getting any reporting on the quality of the different languages that you're doing, let's say you have a really not good, I'm just going to say it, a really bad Lithuanian translation team working on your stuff. Do you speak Lithuanian? Don't answer that if you're Lithuanian. Chances are no, right? So you're not even going to know that it's a bad translation, right? They could be translating it into Slovenian and you wouldn't even know, right? Until you get a complaint from your users. And then by that time, your customers are upset. Your boss is upset. And you've got six months worth of crappy content in your TM that you need to go back and fix, right? So the idea behind the reporting and the transparency is you want to be detecting those issues before they arise. And of course, we've gone over a lot of this already. We're getting kind of into the review portion of this here. You can do self-certification. You can do internal review. You can do third-party OQA. The scope is going to be dependent upon word counts, constraints like budget and timeline and schedule. Going back to the question um, posed previously, 10% or 1,000 words as a minimum is a general baseline for that. Um, and, of course, the scope can be reassessed over time. This is another area where you know the proactive reporting comes in Great. If you have a language is a language that is consistently meeting KPIs and has been for the last six months, well, guess what? Let's save some money and stop QAing ten percent. We're going to QA five percent of that language from now on. We're going to take that extra budget that we just freed up, and we're going to allocate that towards additional reviews for one of the languages that isn't doing 
so hot, right? So this is where the project management and strategy really comes into play with this. It becomes more about quality and more about the holistic quality program that's going to be helping drive business decisions, not just quality decisions, not just customer satisfaction decisions, but business decisions. Um, I could show you slides and slides and slides of BI dashboards for quality. I think my main point, though, is put it into a dashboard and make that dashboard available for all stakeholders. Quality, no one should ever be surprised about quality. You don't need to wait three months for the QBR, the quarterly business review, to be reporting on quality. You don't. It can be in a dashboard. Now, if you don't have a complex, and I actually have a workshop where I showed how, I think it's called like sim dashboarding made easy. I'm sure it's available on our YouTube channel, which someone put a link in um, up above in the comments. And it's like an hour. And it's like, here's how you use a free tool called Google Data Studio and Google Sheets to create super simple dashboards. It, it's, it's, you don't need to hire a high price developer to create data dashboards. Now, a lot of LSPs out there do have high price developers and they do have high price data dashboards and that's fine, that's, that's cool too. But the point is have one and make it available for everybody. Have the information that helps you make better business decisions. Don't, don't go into data ego mode where you're reporting everything just because you can Right? Too much data is the same as not enough data because if there's too much data, it becomes analysis paralysis, it becomes information overload, and you're not able to make better business decisions because you're either scared of looking at it because it's too much, it's overwhelming, or you're not, you know, the low priority data is distracting you from being able to focus on what is actually higher priority. That having been said, there's all sorts of different ways that you can slice and dice the data. Um, pretty much any of those categories, severities, um, language types, uh, you can, the ones that I would highly recommend though is create filters so that you can view the quality results based upon language, of course, right? That's, that's, that gets you in the door, but also based upon reviewer and based upon translator. Translator, because you want to be able to understand, is this translator delivering good quality or not? Reviewer, because you want to be able to understand, is this reviewer good or not? You know, just be, if a translator, if translations are consistently coming up with poor quality in the LQA results, that could mean that the translation is bad. It also could mean that you have an activist reviewer on your hands and that reviewer needs to chill out a little bit, right? Or a bad reviewer. Maybe the reviewer is making um, logging issues that are actually errors, that are actually counterproductive. The reviewer might not be following the style guide, for example. So that helps you analyze those different things. But essentially the criteria that are important to you, that's what you're going to want to be putting into your data dashboards whether you use Power BI, Google Data Studio, Tableau, just good old Excel, right? Or, I mean, draw them up by hand, scan them and put them into a PDF and send them to your client once a month, right? Whatever works for you. Um, I'm lazy, so I like things that are automatically updated and that I don't have to be manually touching. So... Power BI, Tableau, Data Studio, linked to an Excel, Google Sheet, something like that, or the repository of data. That's what's going to work for me. Talking about real issues versus preferential issues. How do you determine the difference? And I've been in the middle of some interesting, lively debates between translator and a reviewer. And that's when we go into this... Um, we call an arbitration process. When the translator and the reviewer can't decide, let's say a reviewer provides some feedback and the translator says, no, you're wrong. Uh, this is when we talk about our arbitration and some steps that we can go through. First, send it for review and arbitration. Get a second, get a third pair of eyes on it. Get someone else in the middle. This is where your brand champions, your country, your market champions come into play, right? 
Um, I have a colleague, John Ritzdorf, a solutions architect. I think he's at Procore now. He, um, he calls it the voice of God, right? Who is the voice of God for each language? Which means when there's a dispute between the translator and the reviewer, who gets to say, nope, command decision. I choose this term or I choose this capitalization style or whatever. So figure out who your voice of God is on that. Uh, next, make sure everyone has access to the same references and information. Like I said, style guides are only good if people have access to them. Check against the common uh, references at every stage. So translation, review, or editing, review. Get everyone access to the QA framework for the specific content. Like I said, keep all of that in the same place. If you're a SharePoint shop, use SharePoint. If you're using Google Drive, use Google Drive. I don't care what it is. Just make sure all of the stuff is in one place so people aren't juggling multiple different environments. If in doubt, seek out feedback from the client-side linguistic champions. This is more talking to the vendors here. Um, as a vendor, it's our job to make our client's life easier and not come to them with randomizing issues and problems and stuff. So we try to keep that stuff in-house, but, you know, Sometimes you got to bring in the big boss, especially if your big boss is the voice of God, right? Which is to say the client. And preferential issues. Preferential issues can be reviewed, discussed, accepted, and implemented. Now, which is to say, and the whole point behind that is just because an issue is preferential um, doesn't mean it's not a good, good advice, right? It just means maybe it shouldn't be count against the translator when it comes to the LQA score, but it actually can be good advice. And preferential issues are an important part of a program. And I know there's a lot of PMs out there, particularly on the vendor side, that get frustrated at the client sending a ton of pre preferential issues. And it becomes this rallying cry of, these aren't real issues, they're preferential issues, as if like that's a bad thing. Well, it's a bad thing in that it randomizes team. It creates work for the teams, and they're, it's something that else to be managed. But preferential issues, think of it this way. If you're a vendor and you're frustrated at all the preferential issues you're getting from your client, think of it this way. This client is communicating with you what they want and how you can make them happy. As a vendor, it's your job to make the client happy. So what more can you ask for? And then the client clearly stating, this is what we want. Now, this is assuming the preferential issues are reasonable and not rewriting the text and they're consistent. They're not you know, changing things back and forth all of the time. It's making a bunch of assumptions. But preferentials can be a very good thing. If nothing else, they're, they start quality conversations, very insightful conversations that are going to help you get to the bottom of answering that question that we started this presentation with, which is what is quality? What is quality for you? What is quality for your customers? What is quality for your users, right? And they can lead to updates in the glossary, updates in the style guide. And um, just in general, this is, this is where we get the continuous improvement to the program, um, continuous, continuously evolving the localization program. So to wrap up this last section here, I told you we'd get it in 10, 15 minutes, uh, for consideration. Reporting language quality is important to monitor the health of each language pair and to identify potential issues before they get out of control. Don't have six months of bad translations in your TMs, remember. Not every word needs to be QA'd in order to get an understanding of quality levels. You can define scope of QA for each language. Like I said, 10%. Uh, Seems to be the rule of thumb, minimum 1,000 words. That can go up or down depending upon the health of each language. Over time, it can go up or down depending upon the maturity of the language. Uh, data dashboards allow all stakeholders to understand the linguistic quality health of a program in real time and should be reviewed regularly. Do not wait for the year-end review to look at the QA results with your vendor or with your client. Preferential issues should not be counted against the LQA score, but they are still important because they lead to insightful conversations about improving the target language over time. And with that, 
Let's see what else we got here. I, th I think we're I think we're looking sitting pretty sitting pretty here, guys. I'm uh. We'll bring it home here, recapping our lesson. Quality is key to a localization program success. But remember, quality means different things to different people. Make sure you are working with the same definitions. We should start planning for quality since the very beginning. Right sourcing, appropriate linguist teams, and the quality management team will build a solid foundation. It is important to define what quality means for your program. Stakeholder surveys and brand ambassadors are a great source of information to get this discovery process started. Quality frameworks are important because not all content requires the same level of attention, and you want to align your resources to where they are most needed. Quality process interrelates to the entire localization production workflow and should not be dealt with in isolation. Remember, we're talking about the holistic approach, building a quality quality program, not just running a quality review. Reporting and dashboarding help all stakeholders understand program health at any time. Adjusting quality, and finally, I should say, adjusting quality KPI expectations, content types, and language tiers. And I need a second part to that sentence <laughs> when I review this. So, that's it. In a little, a little over two hours, we've gotten through part one of developing and maintaining localization quality best practices brought to you by Nimsy Learning. My name once again is Tucker Johnson. I've been your instructor for this course next week on Wednesday. Same Nimsy time, same Nimsy channel. We will be going over part two where we will look at quality tools, machine translation, and the ramifications or implications on quality of machine translation quality customization and cultivation and going over some best practices, do's and don'ts of managing, defining, deploying, and managing a localization quality program. And with that, I want to thank you all. And I'm not going to get to the comments today because it's been two hours. And I, like many of you, probably benefit from a break so i thank you all for joining today it looks like we still have quite a few people hanging out with us in chat um if you if you do have questions make sure to drop those in chat we'll try to get back to those um later on you once again if you want a copy of the deck that was used today info at nimsy.com if you are interested and scheduling a custom workshop, a workshop like this, or one of the many other subjects that we that we have here at Nimsy, then reach out to info at nimsy.com and talk to one of my colleagues about setting that up for your team. Lots of benefits of basically outsource your team's professional development to Nimsy Learning. You'll be in good hands with us. So I hope you liked this taste of Nimsy Learning today. And Rather than fumbling around for an eloquent outro, I'm just going to say goodbye. I'll see you guys in the next stream. Cheers. <laughs>